Good. No, I, <laughs> I was just about to say good morning, my super friends. And that's not quite right. Good afternoon. This is a very strange time to be coming to you. Uh, audio, I think it's all working. So first, um, I acknowledge the traditional owners of this land. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and to Aboriginal elders and peoples from other communities who may be taking part in this live stream today. And, uh, <laughs> yes, I only just made it here to hit go live. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a bit of a strange thing because I have trouble letting people know in advance if there is any change, like um, if the schedule has changed or if I'm not going to be doing a live stream at all. So... One of the, my problems is how do I let people know? All I can really do is um, post about it in Discord, I suppose, and maybe on Twitter or whatever. Audio works. Thanks, Austin's creations. <laughs> um, yes. Hello, everybody. Mike. Hey, Mike Carden is here. Frank and uh, Govinda. Long flare. Ooh. <laughs> Welcome back, Chip. Um, Scott is here as well. So, as I was saying, <laughs> what happened was my, um, my old friend Brian, or BJ as he's known, he, uh, did his, he was promoted to black belt this morning in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And uh, that is kind of a significant thing. And uh, I've been training with him for a long time and we now have opposite belts. He has a black belt, I have a white belt. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, I went along to the gym this morning for his promotion. So he was, um, he was promoted by, um, for those of you who care about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, <laughs> maybe, maybe nobody. Uh, yeah, he was promoted by um, Carlos uh, Machado, who is a rather well-known name in the sport and what am I looking for so anyway I had that this morning which that started at 10 o'clock which is right when I would have been live streaming and then sorry as I'm talking to you I'm clicking through a few things and then as um oh here we go here's a picture I'll bring this up uh where do I go desktop there desktop okay so this was this morning. Uh, that's me. No, I did not wear a gear this morning. <laughs> I wasn't rolling, so I just went for the promotion. And um, that's my friend BJ with his brand new black belt. So, um, where else is it? Yeah, anyway, because of travel restrictions and COVID and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, so BJ has um, been over to the US. So Carlos's gym is in the US and BJ is in Melbourne. Obviously Carlos couldn't be here in person to do the promotion. So there was another uh, black belt standing in for him and Carlos was on Zoom basically. <laughs> so he um, officiated the promotion remotely. Uh, so today, all right, I'm gonna show you something which is kind of technically chasing a squirrel, but it's something that I think is really cool. If I can find it, where is it? Right here. This thing, this is a project that Chris and I have been working on for quite a long time. And this is the most recent iteration of it. And we've had some good success recently. This is a, the project we're calling the Zero Stick and it's because it's a zero deflection joystick. Now with a normal joystick, uh, do I have something handy? No, I don't. You know what a joystick is. The way, the way the interface works is that the amount of physical deflection represents your intended input. So if you move the stick further, then you want to move faster or whatever. You know how joysticks work. But the thing is a lot of people don't think about how joysticks work. It's something that you use naturally, you don't really consider it. 
And so you might think about things like the effort required to deflect the joystick, but a lot of people don't consider the actual physical deflection, like the range of motion required to use it. And for people with some disabilities, with very limited range of motion, it may not be possible to use a normal joystick, even if you do things like loosen the springs in them to make them very easy to move. Because it's not necessarily just about how much effort it takes to move it, but it's also about how far you have to move it. So this thing is our um, zero deflection joystick project, which we are hoping to use for a whole bunch of different things. And what you can see right here now is it in its fully functional state, which is amazing. Uh, we made some software breakthroughs a week ago, which made this quite functional. So what you can see is, in fact, I'm gonna give you a better view. Let's switch to this. We will get to the other project, I promise. This project, <laughs> we may not succeed, but we'll get to it. So this is our prototype zero stick. And what you can see is that there are two load cells. The sorts of things that are normally in things like kitchen scales and, uh, you know, you can get load cells with all sorts of different ratings, measuring from grams to tons. These particular ones are 300 gram full scale load cells. And so you can see here, one load cell goes into the other. And what, um, what we did was uh, Chris's stepfather, Peter, put this in his, uh, his mill and he milled out the, a slot on the end and we cut the end of this slightly shorter and rounded it so we've got two load cells that are mounted at 90 degrees to each other. And what that means is that we can measure force that is applied to the joystick in either the x-axis or the y-axis using the two load cells. This little circuit board that you can see down here, that, one, that board has an, which one is that? That's the NAU7802, which is a dual channel load cell interface with an I2C interface and you can see the two load cells connected into it. So that's a board that I designed for this project. It's going into a Seed Zhao, which is a SAMD21 based board, and it's doing USB HID emulation. And these are these buttons, are, that's left mouse button, that's right mouse button, and this is a tear button. And at the moment I've got it running mouse emulation. So, oh, actually you can see a screen. That, this might actually work. I'm not sure if, no, the cursor is really small. But if you look at the little window, you might just be able to see a little cursor moving around above the word super. So that is the cursor of my, uh, of my computer. And this joystick is emulating a mouse. So if I push it that way, you'll see a little cursor goes up, pull it back, cursor goes down. We can move to the right, we can move to the left. But in all, what I'm doing here is I'm not actually deflecting this joystick. I'm applying tiny amounts of force to it. And that is causing, so you can see my fingers moving there on the screen. But that's really the finger moving. It's not the, the joystick. There's um, a little bit of loose coupling between my skin and the joystick. So I can use this joystick to move the mouse around. So this, I could use this as a custom input device to control a computer. I'm just going to switch to the actual desktop view. Okay, so I've got this here. You can probably see the cursor a bit better there. So if I pull back on it, you'll see the cursor goes down, push forward, cursor goes up. And I'm just barely touching this. It's very sensitive. So it removes any problems with range of motion. So for people like Chris with Duchenne muscular dystrophy who has very limited range of motion, it means that he would be able to hold this, put his hand on this, and then just apply tiny amounts of force and use it to drive the computer around. And then if I click these buttons, I can do, you know, right mouse click to pull up a menu. I'll just left click to make that go away. Anyway, I wanted to show that to you because that is really cool and it is working out nicely now. <laughs> I could talk about that project all day because there are, lots of, there are actually lots of interesting little design issues with that. We've been working on it for a really long time and had to overcome lots of difficulties. 
both in terms of the hardware and the software design. The thing that really made it all come together last week was implementing a, um, a ring buffer for reading from the sensors and then applying uh, median-based averaging so that it would remove any outliers from the sensor values. And that we were getting a lot of noise coming through on the sensors and that basically just knocked all the noise out entirely and it made it absolutely rock solid. So the behavior that you can see now with, you know, I'm not touching it right now and you can see the cursor is dead still. It, before we applied that median averaging with the, the ring buffer, the mouse would sort of jump around a little bit because it was getting spurious inputs. But now it sits dead stable and if I just barely touch this, I can move that cursor around and I can control it really well. I can move it slowly with light force or I can move it quickly with more force. So overall, big success on that project. I'm really happy about that. Okay. Now, uh, um, 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 Dodgy, oh, Dodgy says, remember getting my black belt, felt like I could leap tall buildings. <laughs> um, so, uh, black belt in what? I'm really curious to know. So, Dodgy, what have you been training in? All right. Uh, <laughs> Scott says, nope, that's not a tiny bug on my screen. <laughs> Now, uh, hang on, I just saw uh, Chip said, hi, Apostolos. Apostolos is here. Good afternoon. Hang on. My normal 10 a.m. live streams start at midnight for Apostolos in Greece. So are you up like ridiculously early? What's going on there? Ah, okay. What else? What else? Oh, Shitoryu Karate. Cool. Um, so, backing up a little bit, a couple of things to mention. First, ta da! Look at it! Look at it! It's working! Sorry, I've got to move my hand that way. <laughs> the sign is working. And. Um, so I'll give you the very brief summary on that because that actually does lead into what I'm wanting to do today with the multimeter hacks and all of that sort of fun thing. And uh, Doji says, okay, pronounced Shtoryu. Okay. A uh, couple of hours to catch up now. <laughs> We've only just started, Peter. <laughs> um, so... The sign, okay, uh, messing around with the sign and trying to fix that on the live stream made me realize that if I'm going to be doing more of those hands-on sort of things, I need to be able to show you what's coming up on different instruments. And uh, obviously it would be really nice to have, uh, have the, the scope come up on the, on the screen. Because what I want to do is be able to go to a view like, you know, this and have stuff here on the bench, be working on it, like, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter what it is, and have, pull down multimeter probes and put them on here and you can see what I'm doing, but also on the screen be able to see the instruments. You should be able to see the multimeter screen or the oscilloscope or you know, settings on the power supplies or the signal generator, it doesn't matter what it is. I want to be able to have instruments that are visible to you on the screen and uh, that I can use at the same time. And that's really what got me thinking about how can I take these different things and connect them? Now, for different instruments, there are going to be different solutions. For some of them, there is existing software that makes it pretty easy. And for some, there isn't. And uh, so I was thinking that the most fundamental thing is to be able to do something like measure voltages and, you know, basic multimetery stuff and stick it up here on the screen where you can see it. So the multimeters that I generally use, I, I've got a few multimeters somewhere over there. Uh, you can see there's a, that red box 
you can't quite read it, but that label says meters. And it's got a, like, I'm not, you know, Dave Jones level obsessed with collecting test gear, but still, I've got a few different multimeters. But the ones that I use constantly, every day, are these UNI-T UT61Es, which are quite old now, but they're like a, a classic hobbyist meter. Really good, well, <laughs> for a hobbyist, really good specs, but not paying ridiculous prices. So, you know, it's um, it's a sort of thing that's, it's a big step up from your 10 or $20, you know, local electronics store multimeter, but it's certainly not into the fluke sort of category, but you're not paying fluke prices. So anyway, I like these meters. I've got two of them and one that you can't quite see. So I've got, the reason I've got two is that I have this one lives in my backpack like all the time. So whenever I go out somewhere, I take my backpack with me. I've got my, uh, my laptop in it and I also have a multimeter and a couple of other little bits of, and pieces of tools. But a multimeter always goes with me, this specific one. And then I've got another one the same, which is hot glued onto brackets, which are stuck on the, the shelf. And uh, that's what these leads come from. It's just outside your field of view, but my test gear is all along the bench here. And so what I want to do is get data off this and display it on screen. Now, uh, there is actually a relatively straightforward sort of semi-off-the-shelf way to do that, but that's boring. I thought I would make it a little bit more interesting. So on the back of this, so when these, when you get these, there's this little plastic cover on the back, you pop it off, and inside there, let's get it onto that camera, is this little data port. And it's got an LED and on, well, it, it's actually only a single directional port. You can see that there are two lenses here, and that is because it's mechanically set up so that it can be bi-directional, but it's not. It only uses one. It's just got the TX connected. There's no RX. You can't change anything on the meter from this interface. So what you can do is then put a little adapter on there, which, uh, let me zip around a little bit, which I have. So there is this adapter. And this gives you an RS-232 interface where it just pumps out some data. Um, <laughs> Amore said, uh, there must also be a soldering iron in that backpack. Generally, generally there is this one. So it's my little TS-100 soldering iron. So if I'm going somewhere that needs it, that gives me the portability. And <laughs> Alistair said, you should only have the one true multimeter, the 121GW from EEV blog. Yeah, but they're expensive. I can't afford those. They're, they're like $300 or something. Uh, but yes, <laughs> if you got that sort of money, then yes. So, uh, or maybe even more than that. I can't remember how much they are. All right, so when I bought these meters, I also, I can't remember if I bought them separately or if it just came in the box. I really don't remember. Uh, but anyway, these little RS-232 interfaces. So if we chuck this back over here, the idea is that this interface, you can see there has a, I think it's a photo diode, or is it a photo trend? Well, photo transistor and photo diode are effectively almost the same thing. But what that does is just clip into that line. Which way does it go? That way? Yeah, I think it goes that way. It clips into that little spot so that the LED, which is inside here, transmits data. It just blinks away and then it can be picked up by this sensor here. And then there is a circuit either physically inside this little bit of plastic, maybe at this end. I don't know. I haven't pulled it apart. We'll, we're about to do that and find out. But if you plug that in there, 
plug this into an RS-232 port on a computer and you open it at uh, 19,200 bits a second and it's got to be it's 7 bit data not 8 bit data but if it's 7 bit with odd parity and one stop bit I think is the way it works then you get data coming out of this that represents things like what uh, what range it's currently in oh, and you can probably see there I've hacked these multimeters to give them backlights so from the factory these multimeters don't have backlights but mine do so uh, yeah it, it outputs data and I think it's twice a second which is a reasonable sort of rate you know two samples per second it'll tell you what range it's in and also the actual reading whatever it is currently reading so I want to get that data off the problem is this is a proper RS-232 interface and uh, that means plus or minus 12 volts so not so suitable for most things I mean the, the obvious solution to this is get this plug it into a USB to serial converter plug it into the computer and then you're done uh, but the problem is that you need something that will talk proper RS-232 and uh, let's see what we can find uh, I have done some preparation for this all right maybe I should explain my thinking a little bit more um, there are a few different ways this problem could be solved the obvious and simple way is to just do a connection uh, to, to fix that problem RS-232 to USB and you can buy off-the-shelf adapters for these multimeters that give you USB but it seemed more fun <laughs> to try to make something uh, okay so you, um, in, okay more explanation in um, uni T U T sixty one E schematic. All right. So to give you some more explanation of what I've done in preparation for this, the answer is not very much. Ooh, that looks interesting. That may actually be part of our answer. Now, um, what I've been wanting to do is work on projects on the live stream and do things you know right here in front of you so not just oh here's one I prepared earlier but you know work on stuff and you can tell me what I'm doing wrong and uh, I think that'd be more interesting that way maybe boring but in any case what it, what it means is that working live in front of you I have to do things a bit differently to if I was doing it just myself without you looking over my shoulder and it's not uh, it's not really so much in terms of you know privacy or anything like that it's more just a matter of it'd be really boring if you sat here all day watching me work it would be the most boring thing ever and a lot of things would take a really long time <laughs> things that you might not expect to take a long time take a really long time and not much seems to be happening so to be able to work on a project and do it on a live stream where you are paying some paying it attention for a, a, where some value of attention which might be glancing occasionally it might be just watching everything trying to figure out a way to do that is hard so I've been trying to think about how much I should do in terms of pre-preparation so there are a few things that I've done already that hopefully will get us part way there but nothing that is uh, that is really definitive I have not connected a single wire I have not done you know I haven't run a single piece of code I've prepared some rough code that might be useful for us in experimenting uh, but that's really just a time saver for the, the live stream so you're not 
sitting here for 15 minutes while I silently stare at source code and delete bits that I don't need. All right, so the things we need to know. First, schematic for the multimeter. Um, let's just go to the very first one and see what we can find. So the UT61E, yeah, this is the one that I'm looking for. That's cool. The UT61E, because it's a very popular multimeter, um, it's had many, many different hacks done to it and people have spent a fair bit of time playing around with it. And uh, so this is, I don't know if this is official. It looks like it is. Under the bottom it says Uni Trend Technology uh, Dongguan Limited. So maybe this is like an official schematic and it's from, I think that date is, why is that date backwards? That's silly. I think that is 22nd of June 2007 is the date of this schematic. And this multimeter is based around something that is close to being a one chip solution, which is the ES51922. It's basically a multimeter on a chip. It gives you all sorts of functionality. You build a front end for it. You uh, have selection, like mode selection. You connect a display to it and it drives the display. But the idea is that this is uh, it, it encapsulates all of the functionality that you need to build a multimeter from you know, like a software point of view. And it's got communications options. You can see, like if we zoom in here, we can see that we've got the inputs here. We've got switches for range and hold and all that sort of stuff. Peak. And some of these things, I think, are not actually implemented on the UT61E. So one of the things that happens is people with UT61Es can you know, have experimented with other things that this multimeter chip allows them to do that are not standard functions. Things like the things like backlight control. Now, I haven't looked at this part of it in detail, so I'm probably not going to find it, but there are uh, yeah, so there are things like the sleep function. There's like an auto power off and on the UT61E, auto power off is disabled. If I turn this on, oops, <laughs> I forgot the dongle was still plugged in. So if I turn that on and then come back tomorrow, it'll still be turned on. The power off is disabled. And one of the things, now let's see if you can see this, because this is kind of interesting. Uh, it's probably easier to see there. If you look at the display, you see that symbol on the display, the S symbol, and it's, it looks like a little computer, kind of. It's like a monitor. Uh, it, I think in this case, S stands for serial. And what this is saying is that the chip is connected to a serial interface. And so that prevents it going into sleep mode. It thinks that there is a computer connected through its, uh, its data port, even though there is nothing plugged in right now, because it has no way to sense if there is anything here. So what Unity did when they designed this multimeter was they basically just took the pin wherever it is on this schematic. So if we jump back to here, on this schematic, there is some pin that allows it to detect whether there is a data port connected and they just tied it. Like they, they assert, I don't know if it's active high or low, but whatever it is, they just asserted it permanently so that um, it, the multimeter never goes to sleep. Let's see here, SDO. Yeah, so that's serial data out. If we zoom in on this down here, this chip, oh, this pin coming out of the chip, so pin 100, and, which way are those numbers? I think the numbers are underneath. So that's pin 123 is SDO, goes through a 10K resistor, comes up to here, goes to the base of this transistor, and then there's a 200 ohm resistor going through an LED. So it's an infrared LED. So this part here is where it's actually transmitting the data. This is the, what we're looking at right there on the schematic is what's behind that little lens. That's the infrared LED behind the lens. And that's how it, it is sending its data. <clears throat> so one thing that I thought about doing was basically just patching directly into this serial data output 
because what we could do then is, uh, yeah, so one option is we could get something like, you know, like a Wemos D1 Mini or a, um, or a Tiny Pico or, you know, one of those sorts of little boards, take the back off this multimeter, put the module inside and connect it to that data pin. So if we had a serial input pin on this device and we connect it directly into this SDO pin, serial data out, and we read it from right there, we should be able to read the serial data. So that's something that I've been considering and ultimately that might be a good way to do it. But that way the multimeter would have the feature built in. It would actually be physically inside the case it wouldn't change any of the other behavior of the meter, but now it's got an ESP in there with Wi-Fi and we can do things like read the data off here and then just transmit it to wherever we want. But there is a big caveat with that and that is power. This multimeter has a nine volt battery in it, which yeah, it lasts for a couple of years probably with moderately regular use. But as soon as you put something like an ASP8266 or an ASP32 in there, that nine volt battery is not gonna last. So then there is the question of how do we power whatever else is added into it? So, um, oh, <laughs> okay, this is a squirrel to chase. <laughs> just bringing it up. Alistair said, in unrelated news, I just used my donkey car to two-year convert another light switch. So at least it sees some use post LCA. Yeah, that was, wasn't what the donkey car was intended for, but if it works for that, that's great. Oh, and Scott said, year, month, day is the only proper way to show dates. Yes, indeedy. Except that I would make, instead of YYMMDD, I would make it YYYYMMDD. Because you can't have any ambiguity on that year. It's got to be a four-digit year. And then, of course, you've got the, um, the year 10,000 problem where it becomes a five-digit year. So, uh, oh, Amari said, pin 111 labeled RS232 looks suspicious. Hmm, interesting. Good show. Oh, it does indeed. Yeah, so Slack DC. So what they've done is power is, what is VB underscore? I don't know. Oh, V, v that would be voltage battery is my guess. So that's probably like a, the RS-232 is probably the thing that enables data out. I don't know. Uh, so, the, yeah, lots of stuff. It's interesting poking around in things like this because to me at least, it is interesting that things like multimeters can be so, can do so much with one IC because I kind of think of multimeters as being the sort of thing that would be more of a discrete design, but of course they're not. They're made in such huge numbers that there are specialized ICs that are just nothing but multimeter brains. So it makes sense that, you know, the schematic of a multimeter is uh, one big chip, a display hanging off it, and it's got some calibration stuff down here. And this big complicated thing here is just a like a switch arrangement, I think. So that's the mode switch. And there's not a whole lot else to it. That's it. The little voltage regulator. Is that the voltage regulator? Looks like it. Yeah. VB underscore and VC plus. So and it would, that would be out, in and ground on whatever that voltage regulator is. So, uh, <laughs> Mike Brown said, Y2K wasn't an issue because it was mostly a display issue. Um, actually, I think it was an issue. It was a real issue. It's just that it didn't bite most people. Um, but you're absolutely right. The Unix Epoch will definitely be an issue. Yes. So, when is that? I can't remember exactly. I think it's the year 2032, but I can't remember the date. That will be a... Um, <laughs> Uh, that will be a problem. Uh, so, anyway, I just think it's cool that this is a multimeter. 
like you're looking at it all on one screen it's one sheet on a schematic and even more than that some of what's on this sheet is not even part of the multimeter and this is getting into the interesting things for our oh, 2037 yeah i think my you might be right the um the unix epoch rollover date uh i'm burying my head in the sand for that one <laughs> i'm ignoring it for now so if we look up here what you can see are a couple of things that are not part of the multimeter and you can see them in these dotted lines what's the time it is 337 338 it just popped over to and i'm still talking about the project instead of actually doing it but oh well maybe this can be a multi-part thing this can be an ongoing exercise so these things in the dotted lines are not part of the multimeter these are accessories and they've included them on the same schematic presumably just for convenience so you can see how it all works now this section over here on the left is a transistor tester and uh, this is a little device that I think plugs into the front of the meter. I'm not even sure if I've got one. I don't think I have because this multimeter doesn't have the pins on it for doing basic transistor testing. It's got the pins across the front for the, um, the test leads. So what this does, this little accessory, is that it's, um, I think it's like a plastic thing with two prongs on it. And you plug it into the front of the multimeter and it gives you pins for transistor testing. So you can plug in NPN or PNP transistors, and then I don't know if the meter does it have a transistor mode. Probably does. Hmm. Uh, it's got a diode mode, transistor mode. Maybe. Maybe it just gives you I don't know gain or whatever of whatever transistor you've plugged in there. So that's one accessory, and then. These two are the bit that are really interesting to us today because these are the dongles. This one down the bottom is the one that I've just been waving around in front of the camera. It's the one with the RS-232 interface on it. And the one up the top here has a USB to serial converter on it. So that gives a USB output. So this circuit at the top, if we implement to this or something like it, possibly with a different USB to serial chip, we could um, uh, we could make this meter talk to my computer via USB and then use some software to display whatever that data stream is, pop it up on the screen, and then you can see it on the live stream. <laughs> oh, Scott said, currently trying to talk myself out of adding a COBOL interpreter for ESPMs used to my project list. <laughs> Uh, you're trying to talk yourself out of it. Does that mean that there is a little devil on your shoulder saying, do it, do it, do it, and you're trying to ignore it? <laughs> um, all right, so, yeah, so what you can see here are two alternatives for connecting to that data port. The top one with the USB interface, and this one down here with an RS-232 interface. And you can see... If you sort of turn your head sideways and squint, it says V minus, which is minus 12 volts, and V, so that goes in on this pin, and V plus, plus 12 volts, and then TXD, and that one, what is that one? DTR or something? I think, oh no, that one, oh, COM, so that must be ground, yes, okay, so we've got ground, plus 12 volts, TXD, which is transmitting out of the multimeter, so it's RX at the other end of this link. And then we have V minus, uh, providing the opposite bias on all of this. And so we've got a phototransistor, which is reading the data. And uh, whoever laid this schematic out did a, a nice job of aligning this so that it shows the, uh, the relationship between the circuit of the multimeter with its little IR diode that is transmitting here and the dongle here with its phototransistor which is receiving. So there are physically two different devices here. This dotted line is the boundary. But these two parts right here relate to each other. That's how the data goes, whoa, jumps over there and ends up in here. 
So this photo transistor, uh, what have we got here? So we've got plus 12 at the top and we've got a transistor here. And then this photo transistor is connected to the base of this uh, 3906. And so that's a, uh, and then it's got a bias here and then that's connected to ground. So when the this receives a signal, this photo transistor turns on, which pulls the base of this transistor down. And when it's not receiving a signal, it turns off. And then this 4K7 bias resistor here pulls it up to 12 volts. So this transistor is being switched effectively by this, which is being controlled by this. And then we've got an inverter, looks like an inverter arrangement coming off here with the 3904. And then the emitter of the 3904 is going through this resistor, which is probably just there for protection purposes or whatever. And then the data comes out of the port right here. So it's a pretty simple arrangement. It's not really a whole lot to it. Now, what do we have here? Uh, just a quick comparison for this USB to serial thing. So if we look at this, because, okay, there are a couple of different ways I could approach this. What I have in mind possibly is, um, ooh, Scott just said, find the RXD line into the chip could get interesting. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder what can be done by sending data or control signals to the IC. Um, yeah, so as I've been as I've been thinking about this project, I've just been searching for what other people have done with these multimeters, looking for some ideas, and uh, I came across someone who had set it up so that they had disabled, I can't remember the details, but what they had found, whichever the pin was, maybe it's this one, which disables the sleep mode on the chip, and they had connected it up so that it would only be asserted if a dongle was plugged into that little port. And I've seen a couple of ways of this being done. One with a magnet and a reed switch, I think on the inside, and someone else had done it with an optical thing. And uh, so what that means is that when you don't have the dongle plugged in, the multimeter will go to sleep after a while. And when you plug the dongle in, it won't go to sleep. So they figured that out. So yeah, by poking around on things like the data sheet for this multimeter chip, there may well be some interesting other things that can be done. Hmm. What do we have? Sleep. Oh, look, there's a sleep pin. <laughs> um, what else is there on there? Buzzing. Uh, yeah, I'm just V bar. V bar? Bar suggests bar graph. And V, of course, suggests voltage. So, test five. Oh, there are some test points. VR res. Buff H, A ground and D ground. Oh look, they've tied the analog and digital grounds together, which is probably fine. Uh, v negative, C plus, yeah, C E cell. Something, I don't know what the C E stands for. Normally C E is like chip enable, and then cell is select, so that could be chip enable select, but a chip enable is a select, so who knows? Uh, S data, S data. Where was the other thing? So we've got SDO, which I assume is S serial data out. I haven't seen an SDI pin. Uh, we could look at the data sheet, but who's got time for that? <laughs> Only people that actually want to know what's going on. <laughs> okay. Anyway, enough looking around at that. So what I was thinking as a very, very rough plan 
um, is, ooh, uh, hmm, is maybe taking advantage of this existing device that I've got. So we've got the schematic here for it, and presumably, well, I assume, where is it? There. I assume that this is the same as what's on this schematic. So maybe the very first step is just to, you know, pop it open and have a look, see what we've got. But what I was thinking of, what I was musing of, was comparing this top device here, which is the one with the USB interface, to this device here and see if one could be kind of hacked into the other because I don't have this one at the top. I've got the RS232 type interface and you can see that a lot of the circuit is actually the same. So on the top one we have a ground or zero volt reference and then we've got a voltage coming in. So we've got five volts coming in up here and what this is doing is using the phototransistor through these series of transistors to send the data into the USB to serial converter. So you can, if you compare these two circuits, this circuit here to this one here, you can see that we've got an extra transistor in the USB version. Now I think that is the difference in, um, how would you put it, it's not the signedness, it's the um, it's whether things are active high or active low. So the data that comes out of here, effectively this is another inverter. Is it? Just looking at that. So that turns on that, which turns that, which turns that. Yeah, it's another inverter. So we've got this transistor driving this, which acts as a, it's like a buffer, and then this is inverting it to get it back into here to be received by the chip. So one option is that we take this existing dongle, and if you look at this V minus reference right here, this line, which is separate to the ground reference or the zero volt reference, if we just tie those together, like if we took COM, this one here, pin five, and tied it to pin, which pin is it? Five, six, pin seven. If we tied that to pin seven, just link, jumped them together, effectively it would be like putting, if you look at the schematic down here, it'd be like putting a little bridge on here, not the opposite of a bridge, linking these two together. So instead of this being ground and this being minus 12 volts, just make it all ground. And effectively we get almost the same circuit as what we've got up here. So we've got the low side and we've got the emitter side of this photo transistor coming down to zero volts. And here we've got it coming down to zero volts. Up here we've got this 10K um, resistor here going to zero volts. Here we've got it going to minus 12 volts. So if, if we just make these two nets the same, bond it together right there and right there, then this part of the circuit, this first part, is the same as this part here. Almost. What am I missing? There's a... Um, so we've got a 2K pull down. It's not quite the same. What is going on there? Um, anyway, I still think we can get data out of it. I think that if... What values have we got? So we've got 4K7 there going into the phototransistor. Here we've got 2K going into the phototransistor because we've only got 5 volts. So I've got 5 volts up here. Here we've got 12 volts. So that'll be the reason for the difference in those values. Um, maybe a little bit of messing around and we could make this give us some data that we can use. Maybe. In any case, Oh, Alastair said, I've seen it work at plus 9 volts and 0 volts. Uh, Scott said, scrap it all and start off the base of Q201. Uh, which one is Q201? I think 201... Oh, Q201. There. Yeah, just take the take it from right there. Hmm. 
Yes. I think, what, how much can we accomplish today? <laughs> we certainly can't accomplish a fully functioning thing, but I think we can get far enough that we can um, uh, we can get some useful stuff out of this, make some progress. Hopefully see a data stream or something going on. Now, so if we've got, if we tie that there and that there, what I'm tempted to do is make up a connector. So without modifying this circuit at all, just leave it exactly stock. What I want to do is um, connect up to this, link that to ground, and then stick an oscilloscope on the data pin here and see what comes out of it. That could be interesting. At least see if we're getting data coming out of the chip. Um, so Scott said, hook your scope across Q200. Where's Q200? 200 is... That one. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the photo transistor, of course. Um, before I crack it open, though, I'm going to try just connecting power and uh, to this connector right here and see if I can get... See, just see if we can see some data coming out of this thing. It's always interesting to see a result out of something before you start modifying it and, you know, making it work differently to how it was intended. So, uh, Echo, turn on the soldering iron. Okay. I think we're going to need a soldering iron. Now, what else am I going to need? Looking around here, I, I was kind of half thinking about this before the live stream. I did put a little bit of preparation into it and I was thinking about using, let's switch to this view. I need myself a DB9 connector. And I thought I had got one out in preparation, but I can't see it. So I have to go over to my big stock of DB connectors and find another one. Now one thing that always gets me with these, I have to check it over and over again, is the pin numbering and whether I'm looking at the front or the back of the connector. So these DB connectors get me every time. Like I see pinout diagrams that have a shape like, well, here's the, the classic thing. Here's the shape of the connector right here. But what are we looking at? Are we looking at the, uh, the front of the connector? Are we looking at it from the pin side or, you know, who knows? So I always um, have to figure out what is what. Luckily, they've put actual numbers on it. So this, is this one numbered? I think it might be. Yes, this one is numbered. Now... Some notes. Time to write some notes. I'll grab out a new notebook because it's a new project. I have a um, uh, IR data pinout. I have boxes and boxes of these little orange notebooks that um, they're, <laughs> they're merchandising notebooks from IVT, from my old company. And they're never going to be used, no interest to anybody. But I literally have boxes of these. So the result is that I, um, I use them, like I use a new notebook for every project. Uh, here's an example, this is one that's on my bench. So this is the zero stick, the, that little joystick project I was just showing you. And so at, when I start a project, I just, it's basically like a lab notebook, but it's for um, for that particular project. And I just do sketches in it. But the, um, you know, pin out notes and things. But the advantage of this, one of the advantages of this is that this notebook goes in the box with the project and it stays with it. It's all self-contained. And it also gives some, well, this one, there's just like a standard sticker template that I use. 
Um, it says confidential, but I do that for all of my client projects as well. So everything related to a specific client project is in, clo is in one book and I'm never in a situation where I'm, you know, talking to a client and writing notes or, you know, working on something and there is stuff related to other clients there as well. So there's no potential data leakage there. So what am I talking about? Okay. What we want here is, I'm going to, there's a very noisy power supply under, you can probably hear it. Um, I'm going to draw, what am I going to do? I'll do the same as that. One, two, three, four, and then one, two, three, four, five. One thing that I've um, I've become very aware of over year over the years is that my memory is not good. So I tend to write notes to myself about everything. So when I'm working on something like this, I will. Uh, sorry, I'm just copying off the screen right now. So pin five. That is. Uh, it says common, but I'll call it ground just to make the terminology. Uh, cons you know, more normal. And pin four is, um, we'll call it VCC. The middle one, this is actually, well, on the schematic it says TXD. So it's TXD from the point of this adapter, and I'm going to put an arrow showing the direction of data flow. So it's data coming out. Then on this one, this is V negative. So what I want to do, and that is pin seven. So what I want to do is, this pen is really hard to read, isn't it? Uh, that's a rather crappy pen. I have one specific type of pen that I really like and that I always buy more of the same and I don't have one right here I'm going to grab one from the other room because I know there is one you probably still hear me because <laughs> I'm still on the radio mic yeah there's one out here at my packing bench this should be easier to read all right so what I want to do is connect V negative to ground so that's ground VCC so we'll connect that to I don't know 5 volts or something maybe 12 volts the values in this particular adapter are all set up for 12 volts so maybe we'll just run it at 12 and see what happens and then we should get some data coming out of this pin so looking at this which way around is this oriented so pin one is there, which is that way. So it's like looking at the back of this connector. All right, time to stick on some jumper wires and maybe even, yeah, that buzzing is really annoying. I've got a power supply. It's an old PC power supply, which is currently sitting um, just under the workbench and it's running all of the lighting on the bench because PC power supplies have nice chunky 5 volt and 12 volt outputs at many many amps so I've got it running like there are LED strips oops all over the place here under the shelves and stuff to illuminate the bench and uh, so right now I've got this old PC power supply which is under there running with a noisy fan and so on yeah that'll do and powering all my lighting so if I turn it off hmm, oh, that's okay so if I turn it off half my lights are going to go off which is not great so which ones am I doing I'm doing that pin that pin and that pin and that one 
That's right. What was I talking about before? I was talking about my memory being bad. Yeah, so I end up writing notes about uh, about all sorts of trivial little things in these notebooks as I'm working on projects. I'll just make a note of... I... Um, oh, cut it. Uh, yeah, things that you might think that you would easily remember, but just in case. And also, I tend to jump around between different projects. You know, you know me, chasing the squirrels. So I might be working on something and then I do a big context switch into some totally different project. And then if I come back a couple of weeks later, I will have no memory of whether the last thing that I did on that was successful or not, or you know what results I was getting. So I just flip to the last page of my notebook for that project, wherever it is, and see where it was up to. So, let's get ourselves a ground connection on here. That buzzing is really annoying. I'm going to have to do something about that. It's only just started it, I think, like, today. The power supply has been silent up until now. Fan is fan bearings are wearing out. All right, so we've got ground and we've got the minus 12 bridge together. Then we need um, the data line and power, and that's it. This is like there's not a whole lot to this. <laughs> the fan's getting louder. It's getting angry. So, what I need is, um, an, what I need is text to speech in my ear so I can hear what you're all saying while I'm, while I have my eyes elsewhere, which reminds me, uh, Andy may be, sorry, I'm going to jump off and launch Discord because Andy may be shouting at me in the back channel saying, pay attention. Um, oh, Evernote. Yes, so talking about notebooks. Uh, sorry, I'm just opening this thing now, getting into the back channel just in case there are messages there for me telling me to be paying attention. And there aren't, that's good, okay. <laughs> I haven't been missing things. All right, so, um, uh, our cable tie said he has a one project per book policy. Uh, was that, um, I don't know what that was. <laughs> I don't know what that was in reference to. Anyway, uh, I saw someone talk about Evernote. I've lost it now in the comments. Doo, 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 doo. Yeah, percussive maintenance. I could smack the power supply and make the make it stop. Oh, cable tie. Oh, Cabletti said Evernote is my go-to for remembering where I was at. Yes, Evernote. I do the same. So I have Evernote on my phone and my computer, obviously, and also. So this tablet right here. Um, which at the moment it's running the, um, the touch portal that controls. So I can switch cameras if I go desktop and overhead, this is how I do my camera switching. Uh, so this Samsung tablet is actually Chris's tablet. I've borrowed it from him and I'm not giving it back. It's mine now. <laughs> um, and the reason that I borrowed it in the first place was to run Evernote because my intention was to do all of my note taking through Evernote and do and use it for like sketching for diagrams and schematics and that sort of thing and it was okay but I ended up uh, I ended up finding that in many situations just having a something like this was I don't know it just worked better for me so um, that's where I ended up all right so yellow is going to be our data out 
Aqui é moda. <laughs> These, um, I'm gonna chop that off and clean it up. These are really, really dodgy jumper wires. They're, um, they're little breadboard jumpers and obviously they're normally double-ended and I've cut them to use for this purpose. But they're really dodgy. They've only got a few strands of conductor in them and it is uh, very thin. So even the slightest mechanical flex, like if I solder this on, a little bit of mechanical flexing and the, the wire just breaks, which is very dodgy. But, oh well. I have many of them, doesn't matter if they break, just stick on another one. So what have we got here? Okay, I need to turn on my bench supply, which has both a USB and a Wi-Fi interface on it already, which is cool. So maybe sometime I can get my bench power supplies popping up on the screen so you can see them. And what have we got? I need myself some... Uh, I need myself some power, clear a little bit of space here, think about what it is that I'm actually trying to achieve. What am I doing right now? Alright, what I'm doing is I'm going to plug this in and it goes that way, stick this, uh, I'll put this out of your view because you don't, well, I'll just put it down there. You don't actually need to see that at the moment. It doesn't matter what it's measuring. Yeah, if I put it there, you can kind of see it. Anyway, it doesn't matter what it's measuring. So this is coming out to here. And then we've got our little adapter plugged in. Ah, now before I power that up, let me just do a sanity check. So I'll make sure I've got the right pins. So pin one is at that end, pin one is there, one, so five is common, goes to seven, bridged around, then we've got power going to four, and we've got data coming out three. Okay, so hopefully we won't let any smoke out of the little multimeter adapter when I do this. Now initially we're not going to see anything because data coming out of that pin is not going anywhere useful whatsoever. Now, multi uh, power, what have I got? V set, let's just start it at nine volts and I'll set 100 milliamp current limit just to minimize potential smoke and turn it on. And it is currently drawing approximately zero amps, but that could be what you expect. So turn on the multimeter and there is possibly data on this pin now but we can't see it because we can't see coulomb people or magic pixies or whatever the things are all right let's see if we can give ourselves electron vision uh, electron vision courtesy of Mr. Handtech. What have I got here? Mm -mm -mm. Channel one. Ah. Juggling this around to get it all in your view. It's going to be a bit of a pain, but let's see. Hang on, did this just turn off? What happened? But I turned it on. Is it complaining about battery maybe? Oh it is, it's complaining about battery. Damn it. Alright, so how can we solve that problem? Alright, <laughs> squirrel chasing time. We have to solve the battery problem with the scope. Now, hmm, this particular meter, I just recently put a different battery in it because I was experimenting with um, with using a LiPo battery in place of the original 
Hang on, I'll bring this over so you can see what's going on. Oh, and I'll turn everything else off while I'm while I'm chasing this squirrel. So I got a I got this battery, and which is obviously meant to be in like a drone or something, and I connected that. Made up a little adapter. Now, where's the original battery? The original battery is here, and it may not have charge on it either. But let's give it a shot. And if it doesn't, I will plug in an external power thing. Mm. The lab was really cold today when I came in here, so I'm wearing a big jacket and I have the heater running. Come on, start up. Nothing. All right. If this doesn't work, what I might do is just um, plug it into the Rigol. And if I can get data coming up on there, at least I can use my phone as like a portable camera and point it at the screen so maybe you can see it that way. This is exactly the problem we're trying to solve. <laughs> it's the, the whole point of this is for you to be able to see meters and things. All right. Uh, untangle my leads. Get that probe out of the way. I could have just switched the BNC connector over. Oh well. And we will see what we've got. And I'm going to... What am I going to do? Take this jacket off because I'm baking. <laughs> Not seeing anything useful yet. Um, where's trigger? Okay, I'm going to hit mute for a second. If I can, no, I don't know if I can through this. Let's see, hang on, mute. And we're back. Now, where am I? What am I doing? I don't know. Um, playing around with this scope that you can't see, uh, which is very annoying. All right, now, all right, we've got to turn on power. So I've got power turned on to the adapter. I've got this turned on so that it can be sending data. Ooh, and on the scope, that you can't see, I can see that there are some interesting things happening. Let's just see if I can get these. I'm seeing little bursts of stuff happening. Um, auto. Do, 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 do. So it looks like we're getting something useful at least. Come on, but the voltage is all over the place. What have I got here? 200 millivolt range. I would have expected a bigger deviation than this. Um, all right, this is a terrible representation. Where's my phone? I'm gonna try to show you what I'm seeing. It's not triggering properly. What's going on with this? Ah, there we go. Okay. I've just captured a, um, yeah, it's, it looks really weird. I've got to tell you, this looks weird, but oh, no, yeah. what do I want? Droid cam. That's right. I need to switch to 
my phone as an input device. Uh, is this gonna work? Portable. Yes, okay. So now you are looking at the view from my phone. I'll try to move to not make you seasick. And you can see the meter on the bench here with our little adapter connected to it. And that is going up into the scope. Oh, you can see over on the right here, bench power supply number one is what's currently running it. It's currently supplying nine-ish volts to it. And oh, you can see my other UT61E there, which is attached in place. So that's, um, it's got little brackets hot glued onto the back of it. And then the brackets are blue tacked onto this shelf so it doesn't move. So I can just reach up and, you know, move it and plug leads in and things and it doesn't move anywhere. And then you can see the other scope just here. And what's on the screen, it looks like basically a packet of data. And it looks really messy. Look how bad that signal is. That is really crappy. I was expecting it to be much more consistent than that. So, um, yeah, hang on, I'm just gonna let it run again. And you will see, look at this. So you're seeing those little bursts of data. And according to what I've read, this is meant to be, um, this is meant to be outputting data two times a second. And that little burst looks like it's two times a second to me. Boom, 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 boom. So we've got little heartbeats of data coming out. And um, let's just, yeah, capture another one. Zoom in on it. Come on, move across there, zoom in a bit more. Hmm, now given how dirty that data is, look how like how much of a downslope this is. It's like the um, the voltage is decaying over the the course of the transmission, and then it gets to there, and then we just get blah again. So yeah, we're getting little bursts of what looks like it could be data, potentially. So we've got something. And I've got to switch you back to uh, there without making you seasick again. All right, I think we have data. What's going on with my phone? Stop and exit, yes. Okay, a little bit of progress. We can see there's something coming from it. <laughs> uh, Scott said, you're doing rude things to it with that jumper <laughs> negative V. Yes, you're right. There was a cap in the minus 12 volt rail. Um, so that is possibly <laughs> what's going on. Um, oh, Mike said, structural blue tack. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, Apostola said, did you provide minus 12 volts? No, I did not. What I did was link the minus 12 volt rail and the ground rail together. Um, and Cobletti says maybe up from 9 volts to 12 volts in. Yeah. I wonder if I should stick my phone on a tripod or something so we can just leave it there. Vset 12. Make it so. Engage. Now run. And I'm just going to change the time scale a bit. Hmm. No, it's still got the same sort of decay thing. All right, so looking at this schematic, if that capacitor that is between minus 12 volts and ground, uh, if I do that, you can actually see what I'm talking about. So this capacitor down here, I don't think has anything to do with it now because we have effectively short circuited that cap. What we've done is tied pin five to pin seven. Those are linked together. And so that is, um, so both sides of this capacitor are effectively at the same potential. It'll have, 
no effect whatsoever. Um, what else is going on? All right. Anyway. Uh, progress. Progress. We are kind of getting there. What is the time? I need to, I need to crack open this can. Okay. <clears throat> ah. So, where to from here? All right. Well, I am curious now, now that we've seen that there is something coming out of this, um, we've, we've seen this stuff coming out of this device, so I think it's working. What I'm going to do next is open it. And the reason I'm kind of moderately comfortable doing that is that I have two of them. There is a second one of these optical adapters because I've got two multimeters. I've got one with each multimeter. Oh, I should turn off the, uh, the power supply before I start unplugging things and leaving the leads just dangling vaguely around on the bench. And... Anyway, the point of the exercise with what I've just done with connecting this up was to see if this really was getting stuff out of the multimeter. And as, as bad as that signal looked, yes, it does seem to be getting stuff out of the multimeter. Um, now, other things I could do. So I could open the multimeter and we could probe directly onto that data line. That would be interesting straight onto the pin before it goes into the driver for so on here basically probe right there like the base of this transistor of q4 or well it's got this 10k resistor in series with it but that shouldn't really matter if we stuck the multimeter probe onto the base of q4 then um, we should be able to see the raw data there as well and if I end up putting uh, putting a board directly inside the multimeter, so I really integrate that Wi-Fi functionality into the multimeter, instead of having it as a separate device that sticks on the back, then this is where I would tap it off. But before doing that, let's try to get this apart without breaking it too badly. Ah, also, haha, hmm. I think it's Easter egg time. <laughs> I will try not to eat too much on the live stream. So after um, after uh, I got so lunchtime today, uh, my mum came down for lunch, and she brought little Easter bunnies for the kids and Easter eggs for me and Anne. So. <laughs> Uh, time for an Easter egg. Yes, I am now old and my mum still brings me Easter eggs. Come on. <laughs> I'm trying to do this in a way that doesn't make too much mess. I probably should not be eating like this at the workbench. It's not something that I normally do. But she just gave me this Easter egg and... Um, I can't not eat some of it. Okay. Get rid of all the little bits of wire off cuts and stuff. So, back to the task at hand. And you see what I mean about how boring this would be if you were just watching me work all the time? It takes me ages to do anything. Let's figure out how this works. Uh, that. Little itty bitty screwdriver. That was what I was looking for. So I suspect that there's nothing inside here. But the thing is that I can open it non-destructively. So I'm going to, even though there is less likelihood that this is where the circuit is, 
I can do the non-destructive thing. I'll do the non-destructive thing first. So come on, pop that. This is where I need four hands. So I need to pop open the tabs on both sides simultaneously. Come on, pop that one. Let's just get another screwdriver. That solves that problem. Why try to, why make it hard for myself? <laughs> because I always do. All right, screwdriver in there, screwdriver in there, come on. And then that side can be popped. Now I need something to hold that side apart while I do the other side. What can I find? Maybe a spudger. Where's a spudger? Or a, there's a pick. That'll do. So now I've got to try to get this side apart. Ah. All right, I'll risk that side popping back together again. I'll get this side apart. And then we can see if this is just the wires being terminated or if the circuit is in here. Uh, it's just the wires being terminated. Now it's kind of what I expected, but oh, interesting. These ones are bridged. Which pins are they? So that is pins seven and eight. They are bridged together. This is probably part of the RS-232 signaling to the, you know, whatever device is plugged into this. So if we compare this to the little diagram that I did, this diagram is looking at the connections from that point of view, which means it's looking at it from this point of view. So those two together, so pins seven and eight are bridged on here. And if anyone can be bothered figuring out the, um, the RS-232 pin assignments, they could probably tell me what's going on. So we've got connections there and there, which we expect. We've got a jumper going from VCC, coming around to pin six, which I did not expect and is not shown on the schematic. That is odd. Not that we should care. Oh no, that'll be part of the, um, once again, that's part of the handshaking. So that will be, yeah, yeah, without looking up the details, I don't remember how the RS-232 handshaking works. Anyway, that's probably what it is. That's why there are more connections in here and things bridged across each other than there are on the schematic. So let's just stick these back in, reassemble this. And I have a feeling that the thing at the other end, the dongle where the sensor is, is glued closed. That's why I was putting off um, ripping it apart because it's gonna have to be slightly destructive at least. Okay, so all the magic must be inside here. What can we find? How can I get this apart without killing it too much? Maybe I'll just try running a blade around the outside and see if I can at least partly break whatever is sealing this closed. So I'd like to be able to sort of clip it apart and then put it back together again. So while I'm fiddling with this, I'll explain a little bit. My vague concept with this project had been to do something like measure this, model it, and 3D print an equivalent of this, but with extra space attached. Like basically, the, imagine a box with this attached to it, so that when you have your multimeter, you can grab the box, and well, it goes that way, and then just go zoink, clip it on, and you end up with the, um, the sensor in there, and then the box on the back of the multimeter, sticking out here somewhere, and that's where all of the brains would be. So inside there would be like a D1 Mini and a battery or a tiny Pico and a battery or something, and a power switch. So what you could do is plug that in, turn it on, 
and it would just start transmitting the values that are coming from the multimeter. <laughs> My intention had been then to explain what was going on while I was opening this. And of course it stopped me from opening this. Oh, I can feel I made a little bit of progress through there. I can feel the blade going through a bit. <clears throat> Which reminds me, talking about blades, there's this thing I posted on Twitter yesterday or whenever it was about uh, blades. So for a long time, whenever I've thrown out blades like this, what I would do is grab a bit of tape, like I would go for the tape box, grab a little bit of tape and wrap it around the blade. And so this is with, after taking the blade out, of course, before I'm gonna throw it away. I'd wrap the tape around the blade and then just put it in the rubbish, drop it in my little rubbish box. Because I don't like the idea of these sharp blades just floating around loose in the rubbish and, um, and being a hazard to whoever is potentially gonna come across them. So uh, yeah, so that's what I've done for like decades. I've always wrapped tape around blades before I throw them out. And then just recently, I saw on, um, on a, one of Adam Savage's videos, he did a little thing as an aside where he talked about having a sharps container in his workshop for throwing out blades. I think it was like one of those Ask Adam Savage videos, which are really cool. I highly recommend them if, you, um, if you're into any of this sort of stuff then you should go and see uh, some of Adam's videos. So he has some, he's always learning and trying new things, which is good. You know, he's been doing a lot of machining recently, which is interesting. So he's always learning new techniques and he loves to share what he knows. So anyway, point of this is, it's one of those things that is so obvious in retrospect. I mean, anytime you go to a medical sort of place, they will always have sharps containers, places to dispose of needles. It just never occurred to me to just use a sharps container. So I made up a little jar. I got a jar, cut a slot in the lid, spray painted it red for danger. Not that it worked very well. And that it's like a, it's kind of like a money box, but for blades. And you can hear there's a blade in there already. So I just did that a couple of days ago. And the idea is that whenever I've got, I need to replace a blade, I can pull it out and just chuck it in the sharps jar. And then eventually, in several years, or however long it's going to take to fill that jar, I can just tape the lid closed and then put the whole jar in the rubbish. And unfortunately, there isn't really a much better thing to do with it than that. But I think the principle is that at least then all the blades that you're throwing out this is taking me ages because I'm really not focusing on what I'm doing. Um, all the blades that I'm throwing out don't end up as individual little cut hazards or whatever distributed all through the rubbish. They're all contained, like years worth of blades are contained in one jar, which is taped closed and at least should be moderately safe to handle. So, ah, nearly through on that part. Got to cut this side a bit more. And I'm just wondering, I haven't been looking at the chat, but I wonder if there are odds being taken right now on whether I'm going to cut my fingers. Does anybody have money on me cutting myself and having to reach for the first aid kit or run screaming from the room? One or the other maybe reach for the first aid kit and then run screaming from the room with the first aid kit in my hand uh, held with my nine remaining fingers <clears throat> do not touch spinning blade with remaining fingers um, come on it's a bit of an awkward shape because of the um, the curves on this so um, you can see the shape of it here. If I put it down on the bench like that to cut this, like cutting like that, 
it's not very stable so and I really don't want to cut my fingers even if it would entertain you come on I've got look you can see that I've got half of it free now but this other side just doesn't want to let go maybe I just need to be more brutal I'll upgrade from cutting to uh, to brute force there we go get that knife up out of my way hey and there we can see the guts is now yeah. get my microscope powered up so that you can see this hmm you know it, it's actually a more modern sort of design than I was expecting I was expecting to see a you know, let's see if we can get some zoom on the overhead camera that might help too zoom the other way in not out All right so I was expecting to see like a really crude 1990s style PCB with through hole parts and stuff I don't know why but that's what was going through my head so uh, microscope go go gadget microscope and let's zoom way out which way is this zoom out Turn down the brightness for the camera, for the camera's sake, and then get some focus. Which way? That way. Okay, so this is the little magic dongle. What can we see here that's interesting? There is the lens of the photo transistor, and there's a chunk of plastic <laughs> which is where the LED would normally be if this was bi-directional communications and interestingly there are some unpopulated parts here there's a Q3 I'm curious to know what is Q3 so we've got uh, let's do a quick comparison of this to what is on the schematic now we've got um, so we can see Q3 R6 are unpopulated and there's a D1 on there I don't remember there being a D1 in the schematic so what have we got here there's no diode in that schematic unless it, it, that D1 is the photodiode ooh Dion thank you very much for the five Kanga bucks and for the suggestion which is, and this is really interesting to know, you can get a Sharps container from your local council and they will take it back to be disposed of. That's really cool. Yes. Um, hmm, cool. I didn't know that. Is that an Australian thing or uh, since you, since you um, sent me some kanga bucks, I assume that you're Australian uh yeah part numbers don't match the schematic yeah and um oh scott said through hole boards cost more to manufacture yes they do so mike brown said probably the same board for another version with tx interestingly the pcb on inside the multimeter does not have the necessary receiver so um it could well be that UNI-T make other meters which do have a receiver in them and they wanted to be able to use the same plastics and PCB and all that sort of stuff and make a different version of the interface with proper bi-directional comms. So now that this whole bi-directional comms thing has been mentioned and someone earlier in the chat said that I should um, that I should look for it the um, the data in line I am curious. I'm not going to do it right now. Maybe I should. I'm kind of interested to pull up the um, the data sheet for this chip, for the multimeter chip, and just see what it's capable of. Because it may well do more than, uh, than we think it can. All right. Now, back to this. All right. So this is supposedly... Hang on. I need focus in order to be able to zoom. Supposedly, that schematic is the same as that device and I don't believe it for a second 
that is not the same. So we've got two transistors, which does seem the same. Uh, yeah, there is, there's definitely a diode symbol there. So we've got D1 is QO, the part number for that photo transistor. I don't know. All right, what have we got here? These little um, SOT transistors are not gonna give us any useful part numbers because they're only like manufacturer date codes or batch codes or something. Those things are useless because it says 24F, no, 2A, F on one of them and it says 1A, M, C on the other. Who knows what they are? But we've got, um, so D, O, Q, O, Q, O, D, 1, D, 0. Hmm. Oh, okay, so the other D, as in the one just here, see where this chunk of plastic is, that would actually be a diode. That's where you, I don't know why they got this chunk of plastic on it though. I think that's probably just to fill up the hole. In fact, I wonder if it's even attached to the PCB. It might be, um, it might be something that is just, you know, pushed onto the PCB and that's the only reason it's still there. It's not attached in any way. I don't know. Seems like it really is attached. Oh yeah, look at that. It's, um, it's been heat expanded on the back. So what they've done is, oh, interesting. So this, you know that thing that on the schematic is a photo transistor? It's in an LED style package. Uh, sorry, <laughs> your um, focus is not that good. And let's fix the brightness a little bit. A little bit more brightness and a little bit more focus would be nice as well. There. Okay, so you can see the lens just there and the pins. So the way this is connected, it's actually, it is an LED package and it has had its legs folded over. You can see them coming out of the back of the package there. The legs have been folded around 180 degrees and then fed back through the PCB and then sold it on. So that is um, an interesting sort of low profile way to mount it so that the lens, otherwise, if they just mounted it the regular way by feeding the lead straight through the PCB, it would have ended up being much higher. It would come up to about here somewhere. So they've drilled a big hole in the PCB, fed the body through and wrapped the legs around. It's kind of clever. So low profile mounting of the photo transistor which is in that LED package. So then we've got, um, was it 472? The other things do seem to make sense. I mean, what they've got here on the circuit does seem to be, in terms of what's populated, I mean, it does seem to be the same as what is, uh, what is on that schematic. And uh, because these are low, um, they're 5% resistors. You can see they're 0603 resistors, but they're 0603. Yeah, they look like it. But they're 5%, which means that the value is written on it in a human readable way. And with 1% resistors, they use you know, bizarre codes that I can't do in my head. I have to look them up. But you can see here, for example, it says 472. Don't know if you can see that very well. It's a bit obscured. That one says 472. So that one is a 4K7 resistor. This one says 103, so that's 10K. This one says 202, so that's 2K. That one says 391, so that's 390 ohms. And uh, looking at the schematic, what have we got here? We have 10K, 2K, uh, 4K7, like they all match, 390 ohms. So those values are all the same as what's on that schematic. So even though this PCB looks like it is not for the same circuit, I think that what is implemented on here by partially populating it is that same circuit. 
Hmm. Cool. Now we've got two caps on the back. 47 microfarad, 16 volts for both of them. And what do we have? Yes, there are two of them in the circuit. So... Oh, so I just realised you couldn't see what I was just looking at. So... You can see on the back here, these two electrolytic capacitors. And they are both 47 microfarad, 16 volt capacitors. So what we're seeing here is what I would expect to see based on that. It does seem to be an honest to goodness implementation of that circuit, even though the PCB has other stuff on it that is not being used. Ah, uh -huh, I just had an idea. Oh no. Hmm. I wonder if. Mm, no. What, what was going through my head was I was wondering whether this circuit could be implemented on this PCB by tying together the ground and minus connection, populating different values. But no, look, this part of the circuit is different. See, we've got here the transistor with the 10K low side. Oh no, that's the same there. That feeds into the 3904, so the base, the emitter here is 2K to the negative. But up here, we don't have that. Well, you could put a zero ohm resistor in there, but on the high side, we've got 10K to the supply. We don't have anywhere to put a resistor here. So yeah, maybe my theory is bad. I thought maybe what they've done is implemented one PCB that would do both of these circuits up to the point where the USB to serial converter goes. So what you could do is have everything up until this point here, like the data output, or this point here, the data output, being the same on the, being on the same PCB, and have a cable going to the USB to serial adapter. So I've never actually physically seen one of these cables. I don't know what they're like. It could be that the USB to serial chip is implemented at the plug end of the cable, and then it just has a cable that goes to the, um, the little optical interface, which is this part of it. In which case there'd be a little circuit board with nothing but a data line and the ground and power that then go to the USB to serial converter. All right. Uh, um, hmm. Okay. So, oh, Scott said, Looks like they've left off the first two digits on the board. Oh, okay. That is making sense. So that is a really good pickup, Scott. So just to, uh, to explain what Scott is saying there, Q0 equals 200, yes. So if we look at this schematic, look at this one right here, and we look at this part, which is the photo transistor, and the part is Q200. And let's pick another thing just for reference. And this uh, 3904 is Q202. Now, let's jump back under the microscope and point at stuff like a weather presenter. Now we've got, there it says Q0. So Scott's point is that they are leaving off the first two digits on all of the part designators. So Q0 is actually Q200. And R1 would be R201, C1 would be C201, etc. Because this is board two. Um, Q3, so we've got Q1, Q2, that'd be Q201, Q202. That makes a lot of sense. R2, yep. So if you look at the part designators on that that you can see under the microscope right now, and then you compare it to what's on here, Q2 is Q202. I think you've nailed it, Scott. Thanks. Good observation. Um, oh, George says there are big, two big electrolytics on the other side. Yes, there are. And they are here in the circuit as well. So um, those two big electrodes under there are C201 and C202 right there on the circuit. 
Alrighty. Yes. Cool. Now. Uh, the reason I am staring at my computer like a stunned mullet is I just looked at the time. What? What? Does time even make sense? I don't think it does. Time makes no sense at all. So, <laughs> um, what to do next? Okay, I'm gonna open up this multimeter. I thought that today we would get to the point at least of connecting a D1 Mini to this and using a serial reflector so that we could take the data from the optical thing and then just send it back out the USB port of the D1 Mini so we could see the data. We're not going to make it. Sorry to break it to you. <laughs> um, nearly two hours and it's <laughs> Joe Anon says it's relative. Time is relative. So does that mean I'm moving very fast or moving very slowly? Uh, so, uh, what am I doing? Yes, okay, so we're not gonna get there. So I think with the remaining time, what little remaining time there is today, I'm gonna pull the back off this and we're gonna poke around and look for, basically I'll show you what's on the other side of this. I'll show you what is going on right here. See with Q4 and D2, so the transmission side, wait, yeah, the transmission side. What am I pointing at? Where? There. The transmission side of the data connection. Let's find it. I'll get this open. Um, and then maybe next time. So while I'm uh, twiddling the screwdriver, I'm curious to know from all of you hanging out here in the chat, is this sort of thing interesting? Is it worth doing these sorts of projects live on the stream while I'm talking to you? It's certainly very, like from my point of view, I've got to say this is frustrating because the way I would do, if I'm working on something like this, I normally work in silence. I, I don't even have a podcast on because I can't have that in the back of my mind. So I have silence and I am just totally focused on what I'm doing. So what I'm doing right now is incredibly inefficient in terms of the way my own brain works and you know what happens um, when I'm with the normal way that I work on projects. But it is actually kind of cool. It's, um, it's terrifying because this is setting myself up for imposter syndrome even more because I can just imagine everybody in the chat saying, no, you're an idiot, you don't know what you're doing. And uh, that would be entirely justified. But um, uh, it is kind of cool to go through these sorts of things with you as well, with other people. So if you don't mind sitting through me very inefficiently working through things, maybe I'll do more of this. Maybe I'll continue. So anyway, what I was, where I was getting at with all of this is I could either, um, you know, do this as an offline project and just show you what happens, show you the outcome or the screwdriver doesn't quite fit or I could put it aside and deliberately not work on this unless it's on a live stream which kind of seems a bit more interesting like the whole idea of begin a project and work through the process with you and show you everything that's going on and get to the end result without jumps in the middle of me going away and solving problems and building stuff and then coming back and then getting you involved again. So um, one possibility is to take this out of the regular Sunday live stream sort of thing. Otherwise this project's gonna go on forever. 
I could do, maybe I could do different live streams which are working on projects, like actual project live streams, doing this sort of thing. And then for the Sunday morning live streams, just be, you know, doing the normal chasing of the squirrels, the annual running of the squirrels. Mike, <laughs> thanks for the 10 Kanga bucks. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> um, yeah, oh, Kevletti says, I think doing the whole lot only on live streams is a good idea. Yeah, cool. Okay. <laughs> Dion said, but are you entertaining? <laughs> are you not entertained? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, any other Nahania skills? All right. <laughs> Let's look at this meter. <clears throat> now, before I wrap it up. So, what you can see here, this is the infrared LED which transmits the data. Now, we've, if I bring this little dongly device back in, and I should reassemble this now. Uh, maybe I'll leave it open because I might end up reusing parts from it or something or tapping directly into this. We might need it next time. So I'll just push that back on for now. So if this slides onto the back of the multimeter into the little receptacle for it, it is placed so that the photo transistor is directly over this LED that you can see right there. So that LED will be blinking away in the infrareds, sending the data that gets picked up by this. So that sits right about there, give or take. Now, what you'll notice is, so this comes back to the bi-directional comms thing I was talking about earlier. There is the little blank plastic thing in there and there is no provision. Oh, hang on, yes, there is provision. Look, on the PCB here, there is provision for making this a proper LED. So instead of putting a little bit of plastic into that hole, that could be populated with an LED. So I think this dongle is designed to support bi-directional communications, perhaps with these other parts populated on here. That, um, that little, it's a bit hard to see on this overhead camera because it's so small, but um, that part just there is where a transistor goes. That transistor is probably used to switch this LED so they can send data. So this design of this dongle is set up so that it can be bi-directional, but this multimeter can't do it. And when you look at the inside, it is really obvious that it can't do it. There's nothing there. So we've got the infrared LED here, which is on the transmit side. What there should be right there is another photo transistor for receiving the data and then sending it into the multimeter chip that drives all of this. So, as I said, maybe Unity make other models that do have a receiver there. And uh, one thing that could be done is to, you know, you could glue an infrared uh, photo transistor into, the pl into place here and run jumper wires and stuff and hook it up. Maybe, maybe. Now, does this come out? Uh, have I done enough unscrewing to get this circuit board out? Or are there screws that I have not yet seen? Maybe hiding under the fuses? No. Am I missing one? Oh, there's a clip. Okay, it's got a clip in the middle. Let's get this off. See if I can get this PCB out. Come on. Nope. Or is it the clip from the, the mode switch that's holding it in? Hmm. What I'm trying to do is just get this PCB out. What else is holding it in? It looks like there are screws here, but they're not. Those are, um, those are trim pots for adjusting the range. So I've taken out those screws. It uh, doesn't seem to be anything much else holding it in. It's loose from there. The binding seems to be all around the center. It's around this area. It 
top part of the PCB moves. Oh, <laughs> it's just physical clips. It's as simple as that. <clears throat> so obvious. There we go. There are little clips on the side of the case. So pop this up. Try not to destroy my multimeter. Oh, here's the hack that, like you see these little wires that are on here? These are the wires that I hacked in previously to add the backlight onto the LCD. And uh, let's see how dodgy a job I did. If I can do this without destroying anything. Because um, this particular LCD doesn't have a backlight. So what I did was, oh, you can see it if I turn it over here. Got it. See these LEDs? So these are blue LEDs. And I've super glued them on in these little areas here and then it just there's jumper wires that go down here and there's a it's covered in heat shrink so it's just it's black it's very hard to see but there is a current limiting resistor right there and this is just picking up power from the main board of the um, of the multimeter so there's a, a that's a V plus point it's even handily labeled on the silk screen that's a ground connection just there, I think. So all I did was take power off the multimeter and feed it through a couple of LEDs. And those LEDs then shine up through the, um, the plastic material or glass or whatever it is, the layer that's in here sandwiched in between. And that provides the backlight for the LCD. So that was my dodgy little backlight hack. Anyway, the point of this, I, the reason I got this out was to expose that. So this is the, the main IC that is running the whole shebang. So that is close to being a multimeter in a chip. Yeah, as you can see, there are other supporting parts on here, but it certainly does most of the job, most of the work. Now, ES51922, let's see if we can find that ES51922 and back to here, hmm, data sheet, here we go, Cirrus Tech Corporation, ah, oh, I hate that, alldatasheet.com drives me nuts when you load it and they've taken a perfectly good data sheet and they've stripped it into separate pages and then they deliver it to you page by page so they can then wrap ads around it. Just give me the data sheet. I want the data sheet. Serious Tech, maybe this is it. June 2007. Sounds about right. 22,000 counts auto DMM. And let's get some zoomage happening. Uh, automatic measurement, bar graph. Do, 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 do. Shift function. What's a shift function? I don't know. High crest factor signal detection with Taiwan patent. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, what I'm looking for here are features that are not on the UT61E. Oh, look at this. Serial data output. RS232 format. Cool. Uh, backlight function. Yeah, it does have backlight control. But I'm not using that. My backlight hack is just straight across power, as you just saw, so the backlight comes on whenever you turn on power to the multimeter. So, pin out, yes, yes, yes. What I want to find out is what we can do with bidirectional data. So it says, where was it? Serial data output. The fact that they say output here makes me think that there is probably no input and uh, all we can do is get data out of it. But um, let's have a little look. Let's see if we can do RS232. 17 references in the data sheet. Uh, 232. The battery, auto power off, repower on, RS232 data output. Assert low to enable serial data output. Aha, uh -huh. yes, that is it. So, Someone in the comments was pointing out the interesting bit, which, it, uh, not that one, this one. That interesting pin right there. 
this one, pin 111 RS232, and it is pulled to VB. I wonder what slack DC is. So by asserting that pin, assert, hang on, assert low. So it says, oh, it's VB minus. Ah, oh, I've been misreading it. That's a ground connection. So VB underscore must be voltage battery negative. <laughs> okay, so assert low to enable serial data output. So it's just being pulled low. And where is slack DC? Slack DC is select initial state. Hmm, oh, idle time selection for auto power off feature. So you can configure the auto power off. Interesting. Assert low to enable LCD shift feature. Hmm. Oh, and there's some backlight control. If backlit function is enabled, this pin will change from minus three to plus three for 60 seconds. Once press backlit again, within 60 seconds, this pin will change back to minus three. Okay. Yeah, that's one of the things that I don't like about the normal backlight control is that often it'll only come on for a minute and then it'll just turn off again. Or, yeah, I just want to be able, I don't care if it runs through a battery a bit faster. I just want to turn the meter on and have the backlight on and just stay on. All right, so we've got RS232 compliant serial data output. And I see nothing more about data in, but let's, um, let's just jump through, oops. Sorry, what you can't see there because it's covered by my face in OBS is I've got a search thing open in the PDF to find all the references to RS232. So, so low, complied data output between V minus pin and RS232. When RS232 output is active, the auto power off function is also disabled. Yeah. So that's why it always says that the... Um, it's got that little symbol on the screen showing the the computer is connected. Will be activated if that pin is pulled to and asserts at V minus. Okay. So serial data is sent once every AD conversion cycle. So, ooh, interesting board rate. I thought it was 19,200, but it's board rate of 19,230. <laughs> and it's uh, 7 bit. And so it starts with a. It's a start bit which is always zero, seven data bits, odd parity check bit and one stop bit. So the interesting thing is uh, this not meter is normally communicated at at 19,200 but obviously that variation, the difference in frequency is not enough to stop it from working at 19,200. Mm -hmm. Use the triggering signal Oh, packet at the data block. So range, digits, and all of this information is pretty well documented elsewhere. So we will follow up with data formats and stuff in the future. Oh look, function. Uh, okay, let's see, any more references, RS232? RS232, hmm. RS232, oh that's just the symbol on the display. And when RS2 is enabled, serial clock delay time after receiving, and operation timing diagram for what is going on here? We've got S data, PLSD data. Ooh, so we've got SDO coming out of the multimeter controller chip going to the microprocessor or whatever the device is out here. We've got a serial clock and we've got S data. So serial data coming in. So what is PLSD? I haven't seen that before. Clock pulses, start to send PLSD data. Does anybody there know what PLSD is? That's for a display. Ah, okay. Hmm. So maybe that's not very useful anyway. Uh, PLSD. Anyway, yeah. I don't think that there is any functionality in this controller to be able to receive 
to be able to be configured or controlled in any way over a serial interface. I think it is purely manual selection using the, um, the input range. Now the thing is that of course you could automate this. If you were designing your own multimeter around this chip, then you've got, and you put a microcontroller external to it, that microcontroller can then, uh, can then do things like range selection and mode selection and all of the other things. So if we've got, um, let's, uh, let's just go back to this schematic for now and zoom back out. So if we've got a function select, we've got the, the big dial on the front that you twist and it selects the different ranges. So here we go. So we've got all of these different positions on the dial and these positions should correspond, oops, to what we see around the dial here. And they do. <laughs> um, so what, what this big rotary dial thing is doing is sending mode connection, mode commands through into here. So we've got FC, FC one, two, three, four, and FC five, it looks like it's not connected. Uh, FC, my guess is it stands for function control or something. And this big dial, then it looks like it's acting like a bit of a logic matrix and it changes the state of these FC pins. I'm curious about this. Let's have a look back at, um, at the FC pins on here. So home, no, FC1. Let's look for the FC1 pin. Yeah, it's a whole series of switches. So basically these are mode switches, FC1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then we've got slack and all that sort of stuff. So what you could do is have, oh, UPLCD, UP microprocessor LCD. It must be what it stands for. Hmm. Anyway, we've got mode pins along the top here. That make it do different things. So let's see what FC one two three switch one for function selection. Yes, obviously. But what are the function selections? Take us to it. Function selections. All right. Current measurement. Here we go. So FC one to four. These four input pins are what set the mode for the meter. So. FC 1 to 4, if it's 1, 1, 0, 1, then it goes into current measurement automatic 1 with those scales, etc. And if we scroll down, we've probably got, yeah. So somewhere around, there's probably a summary table that shows all the possible combinations of these four bits. And FC 1, 1, yeah, okay. So it's only, it's only four bits, which means it's only, what, 16 possible operating modes. Uh, but anyway, the point I was making was, oh, here we go, <laughs> measurement mode switching. So slack DC, so it's five bits. All right, so slack DC is like the, um, the most significant bit. And then FC one to four, the state of those pins puts it into one of these operating modes. So what you could do without very much trouble at all would be to, uh, instead of having this big switching matrix here, which is putting different values onto these pins, you could replace all of this with a microcontroller, which just drove those pins. Oh look, they've pulled slack Ah, hang on, this is worth looking at. So slack DC is pulled low and FC one to four are selectable. So if we go back to here, slack DC is pulled low, which means that we get all of those possible ranges down to here, but it means that it is impossible to select these other ranges what does that lock us out of? DC to AC volts, AC volts to DC volts. Voltage measurement. Oh, okay. No, I think it's just that um, because there are multiple, uh, yeah, it's just the key mode. 
So it's a question of what is prioritized. So with the key input that allows you to select between different sub ranges, it starts off as DC volts and then goes to AC volts. Or with select DC high, it starts off as AC volts and then you press key and it goes to DC volts. So that doesn't actually lose us anything. It's really just like a mirror image of the mode table. So these are all the different modes that we can put the multimeter into by controlling just FC1 to FC4. So yeah, you could replace all of that with a microcontroller and you could put it into whatever range you want under software control. And if you're doing that, then of course you would take your microcontroller and read the data from it so you wouldn't need this. You would take the data out from here and you would read it into a serial port or something on your microcontroller. And then you could have a fully controllable multimeter, which would be receiving the data from this chip. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> Stephen said, select DC is select AC or DC, yes. Yeah, so that actually does make sense now. So it's going to be either selecting AC first or DC first, depending on the position of the key input. Cool. Um, oh, Philip says, hello from a cold Sunday morning in Ireland. Oh, uh, Dion said, PLSD means pulse length serial data. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and Mike said, doesn't the switch also switch the input terminals as well? Uh, maybe. Let's see. Input terminals. So we've got 10 amp terminal, milliamp, microamp terminal, common, and the V plus. And are they switched? That one possibly. Now, in terms of a representation of the um, the connections, this is really hard to follow. But if, for example, you had this in, uh, I'm not even sure how to interpret this. Is what I'm saying. But my guess is that you see the boxes down the left. If you look across the row, my guess is that the terminals there would be um, shorted or selected. So if it's in the off position, it probably shorts across these terminals. I don't know if this makes sense, I'm just making this up as I go. If you put it into the V range, it would short across these terminals, these sets of terminals. And oh, you can see here that power, basically power is being shorted across in all modes except off. And then you put it into the millivolts range, it shorts across there, shorts across there, shorts across there. So, uh, yeah, is it switching? It looks like in the 10 amp range, that is being linked. But if you're not in 10 amp range, yeah, anyway. Uh, I think it's time to stop. <laughs> oh, Mike Brown said, follow the milliamp line. Okay, I will do this. So, it really is time for me to be stopping. It's, <laughs> it's 20 past five. So milliamp range. All right, we've got milliamp input here. Milliamp and microamp comes through a fuse, comes up to here, and then it can be bridged across to here in uh, milliamp range, or it can be bridged across to here in microamp range. So it's going through a different set of, um, looks like a voltage divider type arrangement. And where is it coming up here? Does it go anywhere else? Oh yeah, so that milliamp input comes up here and then across, and then it can be, it gets shorted to ground. My guess is that's a ground symbol in either of these two ranges. So yes, the inputs can be connected to different places internally, depending on the position of the switch. That is correct. So if you're making a version of a multimeter that used a microcontroller to control these 
uh, these mode switches or function FC, fun what is it? Function something. Um, then you would also need to take into account where you are connecting your inputs and possibly changing inputs into different places as modes change. Um, yeah, and Mike Brown said relays, lots of relays, lots of relays. Have a multimeter that goes clickety click. All right. Um, I am. Uh, <laughs> Scott said, "Why am I getting a mental picture of the meter with the dial replaced with a D1 Mini? Just hot glued to the front of the board. <laughs> I wouldn't be quite that crude about it. Close, but not quite that crude." Um, yeah, oh, Mike Brown said the clamp meter from UniT starts out in AC measurement. Yes, which makes absolute sense. So if you're building a clamp meter with this same IC as its brain, then you would put slack DC, uh, pull it high instead of pull it low. And then it would default to starting in AC range, which is what you would expect. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, all right, I'm going to stop, <laughs> I've lost all sense of time and lost all sense of what I'm actually trying to do here. I kind of run over time because I was <laughs> just talking about this controller chip. Fill the meter with old elevator relays made on slate. Ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, <laughs> I'm losing the plot. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I now have a messy bench with a meter pulled apart and bits everywhere. I'm going to have to do a bit of a clean up after the live stream. But hopefully this has been kind of interesting. <laughs> Um, yeah, where I want to get to with this is a multimeter that uh, I can show on screen. So when I'm doing stuff, you will see on screen a, uh, like a, the display, a virtual display that shows whatever the meter is currently reading. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming along to this slightly unusual live stream and I will continue this project. I'm not just going to stop it here. I haven't, I haven't actually achieved anything today. All I've done is pulled some stuff apart. <laughs> Made effectively zero progress. But I'll try to make more progress in the future. Um, if I make all my live streams about this, then I probably won't have anything else to talk about for weeks. So maybe I'll try like an out of band live stream at some other time of day, maybe. We'll see. Cool. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to hit the sign off button now and then eat some more of my Easter egg. Try to catch up on Easter. <laughs> so I hope you have a great Sunday, whatever time of day you're in right now. And I will talk to you all soon. Thanks. Bye.